So, uh, so I'm Miao Miao Liu from Australian National University. Today I'm going to chair this session. Uh, we are really happy to have uh, two speakers actually. So the first one is uh, Dr. Kirsten Ellis. Uh, she is a senior lecturer from Monash University. Uh, she is an expert in uh, human-computer interaction. Today uh, she will talk about um, total techy touch interactions. Uh, so let's welcome Dr. Kirsten and uh, uh, please silence your phone during the talk. Thanks. Yep. Re it's a really good idea to turn off your own phone. If my phone, uh, actually, if I, I have hearing aids and um, hear design flaw, if I have it on silent, it still rings into my hearing aids. So no one knows that the phone is ringing, but it's slightly distracting. So, yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, okay, I'll just hope no one rings during the presentation. Um, so I'll ask that if people do ask questions at the end, they actually use a roving microphone, because otherwise I won't hear the question. Okay. So today I'm here to, this is such a good setup. I'm here today to talk about toddler techie touch interactions. So I had three children who, um, I actually did some research um, 15 years ago, they're 17, 19, and children were really bad at using a computer mouse. So when you said move the, you know, move the cursor up the screen, they would lift their hand. So you actually had to tell them to move the cursor forward in order to move the cursor up the screen. So there's a mental rotation in that. So uh, 15 years later, iPads came out. Wow, the world has changed. So I'm Kirsten Ellis from Monash University. I'm actually the subgroup lead of the Inclusive Technologies Group. So the majority of my work is around uh, working with people with disabilities, um, blind, deaf, uh, intellectual disability, but I also, it's it called the Inclusive Technology Group because I wanted to include everyone. We're like the Hufflepuff <laughs> of Monash, right? So, because I wanted to include, you know, being able to do gender diversity and toddlers. Toddlers, the, the, one of the, my interests was actually in the fact that toddlers, you can't just put text in. You know, you can't cheat and go, I can't think of an icon for this, I'll just put text in, because toddlers can't read. So you can't cheat. So you actually have to think about the design much more when you're working with this group. Okay, so just gonna spend a couple of minutes just setting the scene of toddlers. Okay, toddlers are too young for traditional inputs. With a mouse, they could, what they could do was they could swoosh it from side to side and kind of get it to run over things eventually. Um, they could put the mouse somewhere and if mum held their hand, they could click a button. But otherwise, if, you, if they tried to click it on their own, they tended to move around a lot. So a click and move at the same time was a bit of a problem. And the whole coordination of hold the mouse, click down, drag across, release, no, didn't happen, okay? Toddlers could not drag and drop with the mouse. Um, as I said, there's been a change in input uh, paradigms. It's, um, only a limited research field, so you have to, there's not very many people working in it. And I swear some of it's around ethics, because <laughs> trying to get ethics through for toddlers if you, if you work at a university is um, difficult. And, and uh, just in terms of because we want to protect them, they can't consent for themselves, but you don't want to coerce parents into participating, they're a vulnerable group, so we don't want to be doing harm. And how do we know that we're not doing harm by getting toddlers? We don't yet. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not a, an evangelist for people um, actually, you know, using lots of, of devices for children. Um, so this paper is not about should toddlers use technology. Okay, that's not what I actually research. There are other really cool people who research that, so if you want to know about that, <laughs> Have a look at those papers where they are actually doing that. Um, but the reality is that toddlers are using technology. And if toddlers are using technology, let's at least design it so that it's appropriate for them. So there's something called a pass back, which is when you're driving the car and the toddler's screaming in the back and you grab your phone and you pass it back to shut them up or to amuse them or to you know, stimulate their little brains so that they don't scream anymore. Okay, so it's actually known as a phenomenon, which is called a passback. Okay, 
Um, so toddlers are using technology. Let's at least get them using appropriately designed technologies with inputs that they can actually use. So I had a few research questions that I wanted to answer. One was how long does toddlers spend using technology? So there's a whole lot of anecdotal evidence out there, but there's not a lot of research. But in fact, I could not find one research paper that actually had a, this is the period of time that toddlers spent when kind of given a device. Um, what type of interactions are easiest and hardest? So what sort of things should we include? And what are toddlers' hand preferences when using touch screens? So how do they do it? How should we design it? What should we be doing? So toddlers as a user group, rapidly phys rapid physical and cognitive growth. And the difference between you know, 20 months and 23 months is huge. But the difference between one child at 20 months and another child at 23 months is quite large too. So there's lots of differences. So we actually need to make it so that we can meet toddlers where they're at. And wherever that they're at is okay. But we need to actually design things appropriately for them. Uh, games are important for development. So play is a really normal thing for children to engage in. In fact, we hope they engage in play a whole lot. But also mimicry is a really, really um, important thing. So for those who sweep the floor, you know, you sweep the floor, your child sweeps the floor beside you. Or if you dig in the garden, your child digs in the garden. And if you wash the dishes, your child wants to wash the dishes. And as soon as they're actually capable of doing it in any sort of competent way, they're not interested anymore. <laughs> um, but it, so it's a very normal thing. So if we're all sitting using our iPads or our iPhones, you can expect that toddlers would expect to be mimicking us because they're learning about their world. As Yugoski's theory, for those who like theory, which I'm not going into because I hate it. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so rapid uptake of technology, duh, I'm sure you've worked that. And I was talking about that native input paradigm. So the great thing about an iPad is if you want to move something from there to there, you move it from there to there. You don't have to move it up while to move it forward or move it forward to move it up. There's no translation required. So it, it's actually a native input paradigm. So there's no translation required. So what I did was I went out to, actually, a research assistant went out for me to um, three different childcare centres. We had 42 children participate, 22 male, 20 female. They were 20 to 41 months of age. 30 months is the average age, and it was conducted in Melbourne, Australia for context. So I don't think I need to explain Melbourne too much to this particular audience. So pretty much like the, we have, you know, large intake, uh, large uptake of... Um, phones and touch technologies. I, I built something for a Nintendo DS because I went, no one will ever hand over their $500 iPhone to their child. And a year later, everyone was not only handing over a $500 iPhone, they were handing over, you know, more expensive tablets. So as a society, the price of our children toy, children's toys have gone from like $20, $30, $50 to... 500 and it's not that unusual for kids to break screens on a pretty regular basis. So as a society, we've actually moved. Procedure, so on site at three different childcare centres. The children got verbal instructions. They got a demonstration um, if they you know, needed it. This was not a children can only do this study. It was really a what can children do? If we give them the opportunity and we explain how they do it, you know, how to use it, what can they do? So it's not a definitive list of this is exactly what they do. It's when given the opportunity, they can do these things that we tried to explore. So we actually did some things beyond what they were capable of doing to check where that limit was. Um, I used this really funky pair of glasses that has a camera in the middle of the forehead. It just looks awesome. But what it meant was that instead of having a camera kind of directed at the kids, it was a bit more natural. So we could get the, the video recordings without saying, here, you're on display. Please give me that cheesy smile. Every time I tried to take a photo of my daughter when she was little, she did this, because that's what Henry the Octopus does. And I really didn't want, I wanted to see what the kids actually did as opposed to what they did when they were, knew that they were, and we weren't, um, being deceptive about it, but it wasn't like really super obvious that you're having your photo taken. Um, and we had, so we had a video, the system collected data, and we had parent questionnaires. 
So the activities, we had balloon popping and these were targeted at different types of interactions to see again what they'd do. So there was balloon popping, you touched to pop all of the balloons and then you got an animation. Um, Peekaboo, you swiped your hand and got a different re reward and you could have multiple reward, reward animations happening at the same time. So a mermaid would come up or, and they all said peekaboo in different voices. The bubble pop was exactly the same as the balloon pop, but instead of actually touching, you swiped. So you didn't have to pick your hand up, you just went over the top. And it also meant if they touched and moved, it would accept that as an interaction. The ball sort was drag and drop, classic, and put balls in the right coloured boxes. Felt pictures. Uh, you could have as many of these square circles and triangles as you wanted. You pulled them to the centre of the screen. You could make them larger or smaller and you could rotate them around. And the three-part book, so you could swipe. You're familiar with, do you, does this make you nostalgic? You had three parts of a book and you could change it so that you could have the, the, um, uh, you know, the fireman wearing a a stethoscope and dancing shoes. So, and they were gender balanced and, you know, so we had a female policeman and a, they were gender balanced and it was like policemen and firemen and so sort of recognisable by uniform occupations. So the results. Um, I had two different protective cases. Fish Price has it right, 27 children actually chose the coloured. This says something, the fact that we actually have a, a um, case that has teething rings on it. I mean, that says something about society, doesn't it? That the same age that they're teething, we're giving them technology, you know, quite advanced technology. But they have it right. The kids actually really like the fact that it was a colourful case compared to the just plain black case. Not exclusively, but... Um, this was really interesting. So the average time for play was 17 minutes. Now, this is not... Uh, this was conducted within a childcare centre. So it was within the constraints of we only had a certain period of session, so some of them would have p potentially played longer, except they couldn't because the session ran out because they had to move to the next activity or whatever. But it does give you a, um, uh, you know, the minimum was five minutes, so even the least engaged child was there for five minutes. Average of 17 minutes, maximum 53 minutes. That was the outlier. There was only one child who got to do that. And I think they were sort of one of the last children through. So there's no one waiting in queue after them to, to use the activity. But it does show the scope of how long children, young children, can actually engage in an activity. Um, the other thing that I found really interesting was the average time children repeated either the same activity over and over and over and over again, or they swapped between activities. And I thought that we would have to, you know, help them out. You know, there was an arrow at the top of the screen. Kids just went straight there. They, they did not need help in using these iPads. That at, and we're talking, you know, 20 to 41 months. They were just, I know that I touch things and things happen and menus to go backwards and forwards. They were really quite competent considering their age. It was just like, you know, you, you're not meant to be biased as you go in, but you have certain expectations. And these kids were a lot better than, you know, um, you know, 75% had used touch screens before, et cetera. So it was, it was um, um, but what they do is they do lots of short activities. So even within that, you know, five minute or, so it's lots and lots of short activities. That makes a difference to the way that we design games. So when we design games, we should design games that are gonna meet their needs. So not one game that takes forever to complete, but rather short iterations. And you can argue about the, you know, the Sesame Street effect. Yes, I am aware of it, uh, if anyone is aware of it. There are issues with shortening people's attention span as a concern, and that's not what I was looking at. I was looking at when children are given the option, what do they do? Um, so these were the two completely um, comparable activities. There are a number of pieces of evidence, but basically a swipe is much, much, much easier than a touch. In fact, a touch is quite problematic for little kids on a, for a number of reasons. One is they touch and they're really, really earnest, so they touch and slide because they're pressing so hard that actually touching without actually sliding is really, really hard. 
they touch, and because their little fingers are so little, their, their fingers actually bend as they touch, and so you don't get a really accurate um, point of touch. So you, you need to either make the object slightly larger or be a little bit forgiving of where the boundaries of the ob object are. Uh, so there are a number of pieces of evidence in terms of completion. Um, the other thing with the completion was often, although they wanted to touch all of the balloons to get to the animation, in fact, when they started, they didn't even know that they were going to get an animation at the end. They wanted to touch all the balloons because, okay. But what they would do is they'd go and look for you to go. <laughs> you, so they, it was a really social thing for them to do. It wasn't about them going, I'm going to do this as fast as I can. It was like, hey, mum. You know, I ran 100 metres. It, it, it was that looking for reward from the parents. So even if children are using technology, parents should be in, sitting, engaging with them, almost like reading a story and, and rewarding them for their efforts. Because that's what children are actually after, is, is that interaction and that reward and that, that feedback that, you know, this is fun and that's something we do together. Drag and drop behaviours. So um, there were... Um, there were 27 who, children who completed the drag and drop of the ball sort, getting the balls in the right colours. Some children didn't choose to put them in the right box. Most did. And I will say chose. So it, some couldn't do it because they couldn't drag and drop. Some chose not to drag, you know, not to put them in the same colour box. Um, some of them, you know, lined up the balls, etc. The felt pictures, okay, so there were a couple of things that were really interesting from watching this. And this is what we, although we had sort of gold going in. Okay, so the children, um, no problem dragging and dropping, super easy. M for majority of kids, they could drag and drop. They could pinch in easier than um, flicking out. So flicking out was hard. They... Um, couldn't rotate at all. Forget rotate, they're not interested in rotating. Because if you have eyes that are, or a nose that isn't facing the right direction, they don't care, and it's too hard for them. And the other thing is, they didn't build pictures. I wanted them to build, I thought they were going to build pictures. Here, build pictures. What they did was they shape sorted. So they went from triangle to triangle, triangle to triangle, triangle to triangle, circle, 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 circle. And you could do as many as you like. So they spent ages shifting all these pieces across. And they were never going to get to the bottom because it wasn't designed to do that. But it was really interesting because what I thought I was designing for was not what the children did. Um, most used index finger on one hand. Some used index fingers on both hands. Okay, so majority it was either, you know, we had a couple of lefties, mostly right. Some would go, if it, basically if it was on this side of the screen, they'd touch with this hand, this hand. Um, we also had thumbs, flat hands, typing, because that's what mum does, I type. Um, you know, an elbow, a toy with its nose. Expe behaviors that, that's when you get to artificial intelligence. When a robot can use a toy to touch a screen, then we've got to artificial intelligence. That's true creativity. And takeaway message, interaction design for toddlers is important. If we are going to hand out over our devices, let's design things well. Use kids' cases, they protect them if you drop them, because we do break screens on a regular basis, and the kids did actually like the cases. Uh, several short games as opposed to one long game. Interaction. Absolutely, go with swipe games, it, you know, to start with. Then touch, drag and drop is fine. Don't bother with pinch until they get a little bit older. And rotate, forget. Um, and for toddlers, they, we talk about the goods and evils of technology. For toddlers, it's about play. It's about play, it's about interacting, it's about looking at mum and getting a reward, etc. Any questions? Um, so my question is, did you find anything that, from working with toddlers, that could be useful for um, designing for adults? Absolutely. So, so um, yes, I would absolutely agree. And, and that's one of the things with working at the extremes is, so stuff like for older people, again, that same, um, if you haven't, 
once you've learnt, you know, to keep very still as you're touching something, it's fine. But I've actually seen elderly people first using technologies, actually a little bit of grace in their, in their touch is really useful. So absolutely. And it's often around, yeah, the design at the outside that we actually learn about the people in the middle. Hi, um, so I'm actually currently data collecting sort of similar research with parents and kids and we're filming them and how they use together. Do you think parents know how to support kids in these kind of interactions with games? Huge amount of variability, I would actually say. So, and it's probably based on either what they've been modelled as parents. So you've got the parents who sit their kids on their lap, read a book to them from gurgling age, you know, like from really young. And I think it's probably the same with technology. For some people, they either don't know how, you know, to model good behaviour, or they don't, um, yeah, they just don't know what they're meant to be doing, or they're here, they're actually using it as a babysitting device. So I guess that's what I'm saying. We can use them in responsible ways to actually be educative and support relationship building, and then we can also use them as a here, nick off, I don't want to see you, kind of a... a, a get rid of the child, <laughs> entertain them mm. on their own. So, and sometimes that's important, like sometimes that's actually necessary as a parent. I had three children under three. I absolutely get that sometimes that's actually useful, being able to have a child play on their own. And it's good for them too, to be able to learn to play on their own. But I think there's a vast, you know, and, and it's about being thoughtful about the way that we use these yeah. things. Do you think advice can come out of here for parents as to what they can do? Yeah, I'll talk to you about writing a paper on it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, I saw you did a parent questionnaire as well as yep. the actual interaction watching. Yep. Was there a big discrepancy in what the parents thought the kids could do and what they could actually do or what they or how they used the devices in the past? Was there any kind of... No, I would actually say that the parents were actually pretty accurate on what their kids were able to do. Yep. Um, in fact, there, and there were, were things that I didn't look at because I, I was thinking that kids couldn't read, but parents were reporting, that, which they... Probably can't, but um, kids could get into like videos going through written menus because what they do is they learn the pattern of that written menu so that it's still an icon for them. They're not actually reading the individual letters. So parents were actually reporting that kids can, could do more uh, different things to what I was actually looking at. So, but parents were actually pretty accurate with, with what they um, were reporting. I'll ask one more. <clears throat> was there any correlation between um, the usage times of these games and their home culture of using technology? No. I mean, and, and that's a, I didn't actually do a, like I didn't do a thing, but I'd actually say no. And same as age, even between the 20 and 40, there was no, so I did look for a correlation between age. There was no difference in age. Um, so I've got, this is 20 minutes worth of results, I've got like 60 pages of, of um, there was no, you know, younger children had less time. There was a small amount of difference in terms of, uh, I think, children about 23 months before they could easily drag and drop. Um, but other than that, there wasn't even a difference in age or anything like that. So no, it didn't, didn't seem to, it, more unique differences in children. Okay. I have a quick question. So did you find that but these kids that you were researching already had like a significant amount of experience with the technology. Like these kids that were really young were already using it very often at home. Yeah, yeah, it was terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so seventy-five. These, I was looking at you know um, twenty-month-olds. Seventy-five percent of them had already used. And and the first handover was at six months. So my child first used the phone at six months. Mind you, those those old. Activity pads where you turn the button, touch the thing, get a bing, slide a thing, which are good for motor skills. <laughs> I just think we're all going to have amazing motor skills, you know, fine motor skills and no ability to hold a pen, like no physical strength in our hands if we're not really careful. In terms of it's fine, but we just need to keep the balance there. Yep. Okay, good. Thank, thank the speaker. Thanks, Dr. Alice. Uh, so is this your phone?
So hello everyone, uh, welcome to this session. I'm uh, Miao Miao Liu, uh, lecturer from Australian National University. I'm going to chair this session. So we are going to have a speaker like Ms. Um, Namrata Srivastava from University of Melbourne. Uh, her research expertise is in learning analytics. So she is going to talk about using uh, contactless sensors to estimate learning difficulty in digital learning environments. So let's welcome the speaker to give the talk. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome to my talk. Today, I'll be talking about my PhD research, which is or how we can use different sensors like eye trackers and thermal cameras in online learning environments. So first about me, my name is Namrita. I am a PhD candidate at University of Melbourne. I work in the discipline of learning analytics. I am supervised by four uh, experts in the field. So all these experts work in three different areas. James and Sarah, they work in uh, machine learning. Dr. Eduardo Veloso, he works in, uh, in HCI, and Dr. Jason Lodge, he is an educational psychologist. So together as a team, we are working to find, to develop system with using sensors, how can we estimate the cognitive states of the student in a digital learning environment. So first of all, why digital learning environment? So what we have seen nowadays is a changing classroom. From the classroom on the left side, it has changed to something what is on the right side. So earlier, we used to have a traditional classroom where there was a direct interaction between a teacher and a student. But now it has changed to somewhat what is known as online learning, where there is no direct interaction between the teacher and a student. They are interacted through a learning system. So that's the situation which is right now. So what is the problem and what was my motivation behind this research? So in this kind of system, the online learning system, there is a student, there is a learning system, and there is a teacher. So they have certain question in their mind. For example, if you are talking about online learning, you can have a material like a video lecture or tutorials. So there can be different style of doing the same video lecture. You can make a lecture with animation, you can make a lecture with text or we're using a digital ink. So the teacher have a question like, what is the impact of different instructional design on the student learning? Like, is animated better, animation better, or text better? Or, okay, if they are watching a video lecture, which part of the lecture was easy or difficult for them? So to, add, to answer these questions, we are trying to develop. That's the motivation behind my research. So I'm trying to develop systems. A student, they have questions like, OK, if I'm following a learning path, so where am I going and how am I going? Am I following the right path or not? So that's the question from the student. So to do this, what, uh, when I did my literature review, I saw like, OK, what has been done before? So these states, like, in order to predict what is happening in someone's mind, we call that like we are predicting the cognitive states. So in order to predict the cognitive states, like, OK, are you feeling bored? Are you feeling confused? Are you, feeling, uh, are you facing any difficulty? What, what people have done, they have either asked the students directly. OK, how to ask? We can ask the student using questionnaire, like the self-report questionnaire. Or you can interview them one, to, one by one. Or you can ask them to think aloud. Think aloud means you ask them to do an experiment. And whatever experiences they had, they keep on uh, speaking it aloud. The second of second way is these uh, um, uh, ask the students or these kind of methodology. It's uh, influenced by the bias. Like okay, the students are not comfortable in sharing their own experience. So what we can do, we can direct, we can observe the students from a distance. So observation can be done in two different ways. First is without any sensors, like we're directly, we are checking, okay, how many time they have logged on, what the time they spent on this particular lecture. Using the logs or the digital, their digital signatures. But the second way is you can use sensors as well. So the sensors, they are just a devices which keeps on monitoring the student throughout their experiment. So when we talk about sensors, they can be two types. There are invasive sensors. Invasive means they will be having a direct contact with your body. So invasive, the, uh, the examples are EEG and EDA. 
So EEG is a headset which you have to wear on your head, and it tracks the brain signals. And the EDA is electrodermal activity which measures the skin, skin conductance of your uh, skin conductance. But the problem with these systems is if you cannot, it's very impractical to use in educational settings. So what I came up with in my research is, okay, let's start with non-invasive sensor in which you don't have any contact with your body and still you can predict the mental workload or you can predict something about the student's learning. So I, I, in my research, I'm just focusing on sensors like thermal camera, eye trackers, or web camera. Like. So why these sensors? Eye trackers, if you don't know, they are very small devices. They are very small devices which can be attached on the bottom of your screen, and it can, it can tell you where you are looking at the screen. So how they work is they uh, reflect uh, infrared, infrared lights are illuminated from the eye trackers and it produces a glint in your eye. The eye tracker has a camera which detects the glint and it can easily see, okay, where you are sitting. And then it asks you, okay, look at the screen and tell us where are the four dots or six or seven dots. So it's called the calibration. After the calibration is done, it can easily figure out where you are looking at the screen. So you don't need a mouse, you can easily do the searching with your eyes as well. So that's the power of eye trackers. So how eye trackers will look? This is a small study which we have done. We tried to compare how people read, how people browse and play. So you can see when people read, this is the eye tracking behavior. The blue uh, dots, they are known as the fixations. Where you fixate at, on, on the screen, that's called the fixations. The line joining the blue dots are known as the guards. So these are the basic features of eye trackers. So this is how it will look when you are reading. Next, if you are browsing, you don't read the full statement. So that's how you are browsing. You will just check few words and then you will keep on browsing or searching for some word. And when you play, you are concentrated on a single, <laughs> this is Super Mario, you are concentrated on a single character. So that's how eye tracking can tell us okay, which particular activity you have done. So we have published a paper in which we found like, okay, you can easily classify the different desktop activities using eye movements only. So with this, we got motivation like, okay, let's use eye tracker in this research as well. Next was using of thermal camera. Nowadays, thermal cameras are becoming very popular. It's a non-invasive method to estimate the cognitive load. So, cognit so what happened, a thermal camera is a normal tam ca camera, but it captures the temperature of, your, of the substance which is kept in front of it. So, uh, what is the hypothesis here is when you do some work which requires a lot of mental effort, then blood flows in your brain and you can see temperature fluctu fluctuations on your face. So, we capture those temperature fluctuations and we can easily say, okay, the forehead should get little warm and the nose gets cold. So, that's the assumption we have with the thermal camera. And there are certain papers which shows like this hypothesis is true in a stress behavior or when you're doing something which requires a lot of cognitive effort. So, that's it. So, uh, we, we decided, okay, where we have an eye tracker, we'll be using a thermal camera. But there was no data set which was publicly available. So I did my own data collection. I created an experiment setup in which I used an eye tracker, a, th a thermal camera, a normal web camera. So eye tracker recorded where the participants were looking at the screen. A thermal camera recorded their facial temperature. The web camera, it recorded the facial expressions. And what I added, I added a slider as well. That's a DJ player, but I used it as a slider. That was a smart uh, uh, way of using a, a de the devices which were already available in our lab. So the slider, what the slider does is, okay, what we wanted to do here is we, want, we asked students to watch two different video lectures. And while they were watching the lecture, we asked them to self-report the difficulty. Okay, how difficult was the lecture? Keep on rating with the help of a slider. Just move the slider. If you feel the lecture is very difficult, move it towards the extreme end. If it is not difficult, move it towards the uh, other end. So that's how they were keep on. They were doing the. They were rating the video lectures continuously. So 
that was the experiment setup. The steady design was very simple. We did a briefing, then there was a calibration. We asked them to watch two lectures. Before and after each lecture, there was a pre-test and post-test. And after that, there was a debriefing. So to uh, decide the video lecture, we used two different topics, neuroscience and the binary integers. And the same topic, we presented them into two different ways. Like the neuroscience lecture was presented using text, just like there was no picture. And uh, the same lecture was presented using animation. Similarly, for binary integers, it was presented using text, the like normal slides, or with the help of a digital link. So that were the different variant which we introduced in our study. The interface design, because we were working with so many different sensors, so the problem was syncing all the data together. So I designed an interface in which I can see the real-time data collection process. So all the data was can be viewed simultaneously while it was being collected, like slider, thermal camera, web camera, and eye tracking data. And all this data was recorded and saved. So after the data collection was done, because we were, um, I'm working in the machine learning domain, so we wanted a very big data set. So I targeted 100 participants. So I did 100 participants study. It took me two months to do just the data collection, but it's a really good data set. I have uh, 100 participants watching two video lectures, of which we have two different variants, text and animation. We have the slider data, like what is the perceived difficulty of the lecture according to the participants. We have the survey data. OK, how was the lecture, which we normally ask students after the lecture was ended. And last, the sensor data, the, their eye movements, their facial expression, and facial temperature. So that's my data set. So let's see what we got from this data set. So the first thing we started, OK, instead of starting with the sensor, let's start with the slider. Slider was nothing. It was just a self-reported value by the participant. So what we found was the post-lecture survey, because what happens is when you, are, when, you, when, you, when you watch a lecture, at the end we ask you, OK, how difficult was the lecture rated in between 0 to 10? And you say, OK, it was 7. But we don't know why 7. Why you, rate, why you didn't rate it like it was very difficult or not difficult, which part you felt difficult. But when we replace the same thing with a slider, a continuous feedback, we can know about the finer details of the lecture. So that was the idea. So we tried to find, OK, can we identify different points of difficulty in the lecture? So when, I, when we compared the two, uh, two signals of the slider, uh, across the two different participants who reported at, at the end of the lecture that they faced difficulty and they didn't face difficulty, we saw both of them had similar pattern. The only changes were in terms of the amplitude of the slider. So, and if we compare it with the lecture's content, we can easily say, okay, yes, it makes sense. It, when the lecture started, they tried to increase the difficulty because there was a formula in the lecture. And when the same formula was explained in the next slide, they decreased the difficulty. The same thing happened with this slide, but it's a very cluttered slide, so they kept on increasing the difficulty till the next slide came, which was very easy for them, the binary addition. So what we found, like with the slider, we can easily tell, okay, this part of the lecture must be difficult for the student. So instead of having just one concrete value like 7 or 8, we were having a range or we can have a continuous input. The second thing which we found from the slider was we can even compare the instructor expectation. So what we did, we asked, the, we asked as instructor, one of the instructor of the video lecture to do the same experiment. And when he did, we compared it with the student and we, do, we did a sliding window protocol to see where there was a negative correlation between the instructor and the student. So what we found, it was at the beginning of the lecture. This was a neuroscience text lecture. So there was no picture. So when the first time the terms like exon, exon hillock, or myelin shield, these were introduced, students felt difficulty. But instructor, he knew all the terms, so that he was not facing any difficulty. The second time it happened when there were two slides presented and the instructor spoke around 251 words. 
So the insp instructor was speaking very fast, but the amount of content presented in front of the participant was very less. So that's what we can find with the slider. So the thing is, OK, slider is really nice. Then why we need sensor? The problem is this continuous time series of difficulties, very informative about design of video lecture. But if I ask you, OK, well, watch the lecture and do the data collection using slider, it's very cumbersome. So what's my research is, OK, we have a slider. Let's take it as a ground truth or a noisy ground truth. And can we try to find biomarkers like eye movements, thermal camera uh, features, or facial expression feature, which can replace the slider? So we have a continuous ground truth with us. And now we are trying to investigate which biomarkers can replace the slider. So we have data with from the three different sensors, thermal camera, eye tracker, and web camera. I'm still analyzing my data. So I have some analysis for the, from the thermal data here. So thermal data, when you see uh, the problem with the thermal data set is it's uh, thermal images of a of few of my participant. If I ask you, can you identify where their nose or their forehead is? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to identify the facial landmark in thermal images. So if you can't identify the facial landmark, how can you say what's the nose temperature or what's the forehead temperature? So the first challenge for me was, OK, how to identify the landmark. So what I did, I used a pipeline from, in, from image processing where it's called homography matrix. So I have images from same cam, from two different cameras at the same time, RGB images and the thermal images. And I did a calibration. I, then I calculated a homography between these two different metrics. And then when I can easily find points on the RGB images, I, I captured, or you can say I applied the homography matrix or the reprojection on the thermal. So I can find the same points where they will be on the thermal. So this kind of mapping, with this kind of mapping, I can find where the nose is, where the forehead is, sorry, where the nose is, where the forehead is, using this pipeline. But the problem with this pipeline, it, it only works within the plane area where the homography is. If you go outside the plane because the participants were free to move, the, there will be slight errors. So what, uh, what difficulty I'm facing is, let's see. If you just see the nose temperature signal, these are the nose temperature signals from two different groups. The blue one are people who said they were facing low difficulty. Red is from the people who said high difficulty. So according to our hypothesis, which says if they are facing high difficulty, their temperature should decrease. And if they're facing low difficulty, it should remain same or it should increase. So that's what happening. And when I, and I, when I used uh, the data set, it is from the 16 participant from which I was having the perfect mapping. Like I can easily say, OK, this is the nose and this is the forehead. I can see it visually. So I used a very simple classifier, like a KNN. I got an AUC of 0.93. Very good. I was so happy. Then I added some of my participants with little good mapping. Added three more participants. And then it dropped to 7, 0.789. And when I added all my participants, it dropped to 4, 0.438. I was like, what is happening? Is it my data is noisy or my assumption is wrong? So when I analyzed the data, I saw, OK, during 16 participant, this was the time series signal of the participant. Like this was the nose temperature. And these values are the difference from the baseline. So that's why they are in the range of 1 to minus 1. But when I added more signal, I found the problem happened with these participants, which were at the baseline, where there was no changes. So the same type of same group was present in both the groups, like same type of participant in the low and in the high. So the classifier, it's very hard for it to distinguish, like, OK, they are the low one or they are the high one. So how it works is it works by extracting features. So when I plotted a PCO of this, I can easily see for 16 participants, it's easy to find the two groups. But when the participants increase to 30, 
the, all the data become cluttered, and it, the uh, number of uh, uh, wrong output increased. So that's the problem which I faced. So I'm analyzing still the eye tracking data. I'm writing a paper as well for Kai, so let's see if I'll be able to solve this problem. So overall, that is like my research is a collaboration between machine learning, human computer interaction, HCI, and education. And I believe this will be like my PhD or thesis. <laughs> so to end, I just want to uh, end up with a question like, okay, suppose I'm able to design this perfect system which can estimate the cognitive load based on the sensor data. So what about you? Would you be comfortable in sharing this information or not? Thank you. Talk. Uh, thanks, speaker. So we still have uh, four minutes for questions. So anyone, any question from the audience? <laughs> thanks. That's so interesting. Um, I was wondering. You know, you said you built um, the bit where you were collecting all the data. There was yeah. How can you talk a little bit about how you did that? Uh, the, my interface design. Yes. Okay, so I used a C-sharp application to build that uh, design. So because all this sensor data uh, was uh, like, I, when, when you uh, attach all the sensors to one system, then they, can, they will be sending information. So with the application, you can easily play with their interfaces, like their back, um, I forgot the name, uh, what's it called? Like uh, actual, I, APIs, so you can easily play with the APIs. So that's why you, uh, when I build the application, that's why I use the C# -sharp application. So I, I can easily, uh, like from the eye tracking data, I, I, I can use their API for the thermal, I can use their own API. So it, it became easy for me to sync the data. Yes. Okay, thank you. This is really excellent work and excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I have just one question uh, regarding the part when you were collecting the data and asking participants to use the slider. So were they required uh, to use the slider a certain number of times or you were reminding them or you used think aloud protocols or what kind of... Uh, okay, if so... If you can say something a bit more uh, about that. Yes. And just another question, uh, will these slides will be... Uh, be available somewhere, or you can will be able to share them, or to share some paper that is. Yes, so maybe you can go to my profile and you can see my papers. Okay. They are available online. So one of the paper was recently presented at Kai, <laughs> so it includes the study design and everything. So okay. Uh, so regarding your question, uh, regarding the question, so for the slider, what I asked the participant was, we don't want to restrict them to do it at certain interval of time. So while watching the lecture, I asked them, keep on rating the difficulty. So most of them were doing it. Some of them, like, they forgot about it. So I have to remind them. But uh, it because of the 100 participants, when I tried to merge all the time series, I can easily find a signal because some of them, uh, and later some of them told me like, this part was easy or difficult. So I have a ground truth with the, their interview as well. So I, when I correlated everything, it was fine. So it's like, just tell them like, okay, if you're doing this experiment, keep on doing with the slider. And what was the second question? And the second was just about the ability to slide. So okay. okay, thank you. A bit time for one question. Right. Uh, so can you share a little bit about the data storage, where you store it and locally or send to the cloud, or the, how to design the data database for your storage? So I'm storing all the data locally, so I'm not using a cloud right now because uh, it's under the ethics protocol, so I cannot share my data online anywhere. So what so kind of format do you use, like CSV file or JSON or normal scale? Or Sorry? So what kind of the format? Yeah, so the type of the format was just CSV files. So uh, like I have, uh, when you, uh, when I, uh, the data collection, so for each sensor, 
like the eye tracking data, thermal camera, and the and uh, facial expression. So I have one CSV file which includes the timestamp of each of them. Like okay, when was the slider? What was the slider value? What was the eye tracking data? But for the images, I have separate folders which just include the name of the images. So uh, the final file, the sensor data, it's just a synchronization of all these files in form of CSV. But images are separate. So it should be really like because the image should be really big data, right? Yeah, it's like, a really it's so in size it's like mm -hmm. 1.5 terabyte. Yeah, so because you, uh, the thermal images, if I just store the thermal images like the uh, which I showed you in the beginning. So the thermal images, when you will see, uh, you cannot, if I store directly these images, I cannot find the nose temperature. I have to store their temperature profile. So I just stored a matrix, which was the temperature profile, and I regenerated the images. So, okay. it's, so because we need the temperature, we don't need the images. From these images, uh, it's converted into 0 to 255, the gray scale. So if you say, like, OK, this particular part is 255, you cannot say what was the temperature. Because when you convert to grayscale, it depends on the minimum and maximum temperature in that particular uh, uh, region. So that's why I stored the thermal images. So that's, that, because of the thermal images, for each participant, the data was like 14 GB. So, so it, <laughs> that made the data set very huge. And all of the machine learning model you will run in server or just your computer? I'm running on a server. Yeah, that's my son. Okay. It, it can't run on a normal system. <laughs> yeah. OK, um, uh, thanks, the speaker, again. So let's conclude this session. So more questions for talk. Yeah, thank you.